fathers, Mr. Tannock. Leave the noble Greeks to the ways. Did we get that? Because I just want us to get everything that's been said here. Salam, you have to increase. to how what cost is there <laughs> well on his deathbed he's telling a supposed innocent prince you know um, leave the Greece to their ways right um, don't go into war don't follow your father's path that's what he's telling his child and you can assume that at this point this child was still innocent So we are clear. She practically removed this pair, knowing that this pair will kill him, so that he cannot finish the information that is given to his head, right? And mind you, she was his most trusted. She was his most trusted person. For seven days, Xerxes mourned, paralyzed by grief. On the eighth day, Artemisia whispered the seed of madness that would consume him. Your father's words are not a warning, but a challenge. Only the gods can defeat the Greeks. You will be. Did anybody not understand that part? Okay. I'm pausing it intentionally because it's our conversation next. Artemisia gathered the priests, wizards and mystics from every corner of the empire. They wrapped the young king in Cimmerian gauze dipped in ancient potions and set him to wander the desert. Till in a delirium of heat and thirst, he stumbled upon a hermit's cave. Xerxes past the vacant eyes and empty souls of the hollow creatures that dwell in the dark corners of all men's hearts. And in that darkness, he surrendered himself completely to power so evil and perverse. But as he emerged, no part of a human man that was Xerxes survived. His eyes blazed like scarlet coals. He was stripped, cleansed, glabrous and smooth. Xerxes was reborn a god. Artemisia trusted no one. So in the cover of night, the palace was cleansed of all Xerxes' allies. All those he trusted. All those who had raised him. All those he had once looked to for counsel were quickly introduced to her wrath. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, you can turn on the lights. Um, and Tunisia is metaphor for people, places, and things. Society. Zex is, is metaphor for the boy child that is the face of misogyny, toxic masculinity, masculinity, and patriarchy. What people remember is the evilness of Zexus, but they do not remember that he was one that fragile, vulnerable prince who was trusting the words of his father and trusting his father's most trusted person to guide him. And that same person orchestrated the person that he became. Now, the question is, is he living a lie or a truth? Because he did follow that trust into through a journey. And he did become God. Is that journey a lie? Or is it a truth? And when you remember that movie, you remember the conversations with Antonisha and Zexus in the battlefield and she talked down on him and said, I made you. She reminded him. But the people who watched that movie don't remember this part. <laughs> they don't remember this part. You know? But they might remember the part where the man, the, the king, you know, threw the spear just to prove that Zexus was a human being and he bled. Right? And then the grace knew that, oh, this is not God, and they could fight him. And this is our reality. The people who are supposedly trying to make the world a better place and unlearn and relearn and greed it of toxic masculinity and everything. But if we look at that war, they just showed us where the war began, the Greeks won, but the Greeks did not win it for the world. <laughs> They were fighting for grace. Are we looking at this metaphor where? So, one of you're welcome. Um, one, please introduce yourself the way you prefer. Um, someone who was feeling cold sitting over there and I'm feeling less cold <laughs> over here, which is good for me. Um, yeah, turn this off. The lights are yeah. uh, okay. no, no, the projector. Yeah, that's um, I'm a result of an experiment conducted by. A surgeon for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who thought it wise to, for this part of the world and the newly formed colonial entity known as Ghana to survive, um, we had to learn from the East, which was surviving without the West, with socialism, communism. And so my father was sent to Romania to study petrochemical engineering because Kwame Nkrumah wanted us to be our own capitalists, to drill our own planet, and I mean this part of the planet, and to handle everything until production of whatever we use the petroleum for. So my father is a petrochemical engineer, and he met my mother at a party in Bucharest, and the party was a Nigerian colleague's party. Yeah. And so I blame Nigeria for my life somehow as well 
and yeah so i think yeah i was born there uh, we moved to ghana before i was two and um i've been told that is why the back of my head is flat because in romania when they give birth to babies they just leave you on your back you just land the back of your head you don't have an auntie shaping your head with a hot towel to give you a emotepian skull so the back of my head is quite flat because of that and yeah i like to think of myself as 100 percent ghanaian and 100 percent romanian and none of the above at the same time thank you very much um crickets from the family and the pillars <laughs> when you see that clip <laughs> it's interesting eh? yeah because i said a whole totally different and the reason i sent it to you yes so i was listening i was like wow yes so i saw the patriarchy and the binary masculinity masculinity coming from the west okay. as more threatened by someone who became androgynous you know because when Cersei's evolved into the being they became later they had an androgynous queer apparition you know and i saw that as masculinity fighting an otherness you know and for some reason i don't know if the actor was also black but the person felt i don't know i mean that's just a side thing in my head but that's the main reason i shared it to you to show that spartans these 300 male super warriors were threatened by this androgynous person and when we go back into our african history we realize that people that are in between worlds or androgynous non-binary are given these kind of magical positions in society so that's the beauty of this conversation right when you sent me that link i knew that we didn't see the same thing but i didn't ask you because i wanted us to just discover it here right but there are multiple things i see in this clip but I wanted to push this perspective also because the thing about reality is we do not experience reality the same way. So it is very hard to place generalization on us. But critically, generalization helps for production, data control, data manipulation, which automatically leads to the most powerful people become powerful and the least powerful people become less powerful. So all of those things, it's like, how do you position yourself in a society that celebrates what you do not celebrate? And society now meaning community, family, friends, um, associates, and Accra, Ghana, Romania, anywhere you find yourself when you find yourself in a space where you look around and in the majority people do not celebrate the things you celebrate how do you position yourself Sorry, it's, hmm. it's interesting because when i'm in ghana around my peers i I am quite um, stern about plastic waste, right? About taking rubber bags when you buy things, about um, 
straws, just different like single use plastics, plastic bottles of water. I'd rather drink from my pipe and get to mark this this entry. <laughs> but I try to go for dispenser or filters and stuff. And me, I look but at I see that. In the house. You have a dispenser. Yeah, house. I do. Yeah. I do. But because I embrace all possibilities, mm -hmm. I also know that the person drinking from the plastic bottle, mm -hmm. though plastic bottle is not good, mm -hmm. that's not the person that's going to cause global warming. Yeah. The person that is going to cause global warming is that person that is making millions and they know that Jeff Bezos, oh. they are they are that person that is controlling the heavy production. If you have the strength to fight me, go and fight that person. Mm -hmm. Right? But then charity begins at home. Yeah, so yeah. for me, the way charity begins is that I don't throw this away. So even if I drink from this to survive, I don't throw it away. I look for where to put it. Mm -hmm. But I don't I don't put that on another person. Um, I used to frown at that, yeah, yeah. but I feel like we all take different political positions. Yeah, yeah. Now I look at it like, no, it's not for me to tell you what to do because I also remember freedom. I don't want you to come and tell me how to live my life. Let me make my decisions and face the responsibility. But that's me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with that, like with pure water, I figured out when I see someone throwing it on the floor. As soon as it hits the floor, I run to it and pick it up. Instead of telling them. Yeah, and then they get startled and then they wonder if they should take it from me and find a better way to or because they think I'm going to use it, their saliva is on it, so I'm going to use it to juju them or something. So they get worried about it. So they think about disposing of it a bit better. -ly. It's 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 almost like if, when when I was small, um uh, when you see a really nice um, tree with fruits, they'll tie red uh, cloth around it. Red cloth symbolizes danger, juju, and stuff. The people who are scared will run away. Me, <laughs> no, that is free. Is free. no, so Those I mean, so my environment, I but you see, then when I'm in Romania, when I see somebody buying something and taking rubber back, my own friends, I don't say anything because. I feel like I'm in Europe and they, they dispose of plastic better. But Romania is worse than Ghana when it comes to plastic things, you know? So I'm, and then I wonder like, okay, I'm here for a visit. Why am I going to oppress somebody when I don't really live here? And then, so I'm always just like adjusting, recalculating, reconfiguring my, you know? But technically, at least from my observation, yeah. you don't live anywhere. So I don't exist or what? <laughs> you do exist, <laughs> but, but for my observation, yeah. multiple places can claim you. Mm. And I'm not talking by passport, mm -hmm. by just interaction, by just support, mm -hmm. by just familiarity, love, mm -hmm. community, by even offsprings and lovers and 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 um friends so many places can claim you so how do you even identify where to place politics Charlie, i mean i just try you know much as possible to not like I walk this balance of not being a hypocrite, you know, and that's just my personal everyday battle, you know, and I try and like make sense of stuff. I, I just watched this documentary called Seaspiracy, which is now making me question my eating of fish, that it's eating fish is worse than plastic pollution. And so I'm now questioning my because of the farming. Yeah, but at the same time, then I hear that Jeff Bezos goes to space and he has bent or he has created enough carbon dioxide. No, he's created an amount that it would take one billion human beings to create in their lifetime just by him going to space and coming back. And 
some people will be seeing this conversation now and be like, oh, I think they're supposed to be talking about masculinity and toxic masculinity. But guess what? Toxic masculinity, let's not be talking about masculinity now because there's so many forms of it. So we're looking at the problematic toxic masculinity. It shows itself in greed. It shows itself in oppression. It shows itself in power. Yeah. Which these things show themselves in patriarchy. In shapes. If Should you think of the rocket, it's like a dildo going uh -huh. into penetrate space. Uh -huh. And and uh -huh. and when you're looking at that, you see that microphones are like penises. <laughs> yeah. That we are keeping very close. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm no longer that person. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you look at that reality, you see that people will sit back here and be like, oh, that is not our problem. But um, it is toxic masculinity, it is patriarchy, it is white supremacy, it is all of these things that inform capitalism. Yeah. And the idea that we can take. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, let's, I mean, this is an idea, but where, when you look at the world and geography and some history and you look at where these binaries, these hard core binary systems of um, gendering people originates, you see that these are places where I've had a recent kind of brutal like wars or scarcity and the people have been in some kind of survival fight mode where there's just two jobs to do children and war you know and we are and then other societies where they haven't had this kind of trauma for some time are able to now dissolve these two strong binaries because they are a multiple you know there are multiple forms of people in the spectrum you know and now people can kind of pursue where their energies take them without society, you know, pushing. And I think that's developing here in Ghana, is developing more in, quote unquote, the middle class space because of the freedom the internet access gives us to learn about things, to be more relaxed, to not be super pressured from the average society. Because when you go to the street level, there's that, you must be a man, you're a woman, you have to get, it's still there, it's, it's as there as it's ever been. And that's, that's the way my cousin was operating from, and I'm like, no, I shouldn't be trying to force this language that I have discovered in comfort, because in ratio to him, this is comfort. Mm -hmm. When he's seeing me, yeah, privilege to me. Yeah, when he's seeing me, he's seeing privilege. Yeah. He's seeing somebody that's comfortable. No, tell me how you got there. Don't be telling me the language you are using there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. understand? And I feel like that's why it's important. Places and things. Yeah. Where you find your, yourself, don't just be taking your language or your idea just to go and replicate. This, there's, there are quotes I want to take from the healers yeah right yeah. the book you you like yeah but i've forgotten yes no i problem. know the, remember the general energy of the story yes, yes. i don't I, I don't want to read chapters okay um and i'm going to read this quote um i want Can to I read some yes but i want to read one for you right have a nice I, reading for I, us. I want to, <laughs> <laughs> i'll read one or two for you but this is how it's going to go i want us to just jump in right um this is not going to be I, I it's not it's not nice for, in my head that i want to explain this but i don't want to have uh where did you discover toxic masculinity and no that's not what i'm having you understand this this is this is what also masculinity looks like you know and this is a version of just talking and showing people how we navigate through space right so this quote if you didn't know it before now every warrior family is also a slave family 
the two go together. You don't get kings without slaves. You don't get slaves without kings. Did we get that? And so you can look for the next. We'll just be sharing like that. That was a nice one. Yes. And and it goes back to the film. You know, I'm I'm I just want to look at it from one angle. You know, the angle that society develops this thing that we are saying is not good. You understand? Because when I also said when all these people who are saying king, we are all queens and kings, they in my head do not know what that means. What it means to become king means you have to be oppressive. Because I'm not talking about spiritual king. Because in spirit, nobody is king. In this reality that we face, maybe because you find yourself in a place where you have to rise to some point where you'll be like, no, I would not be oppressed by you because I'm a king. But as you are saying that I'm a king in maybe Germany or in, in Mexico or in uh, LA, that statement you are making is killing somebody in Accra, in Kumasi, in Nairobi. And when you remove color, it's oppressing people all over the world. Let me read to join that thing I've said. Among our people, royalty is part of the disease. Whoever serves royalty serves the disease, not the cure. He works to divide our people, not to unite us. To the royals, the healing of the black people would be a disaster, since kings and chiefs suck their power from the divisions between our people. And on that note, I want to say this. Um, toxic masculinity, patriarchy, all these are titles of what the problem, the, these are products of the problem. And, and there is this idea that I have in my head that if you look at a problem and you f say, this is my problem, I want to fight it and I want to fight this problem, you eventually learn the, the language of that problem. And you might be fighting the problem, but you become a part of the problem. You, because people, people think the way, to, the way to fight this government is now to become, to use their tools against them. Am I making sense? Yeah. 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 So as we're fighting toxic masculinity and patriarchy and stuff, that's what I'm saying. As if, even the conversation is becoming popular, the problem is expanding. So my question is, what is the problem? if that is what everybody's looking at me for but um, <laughs> sorry to disappoint but um, I just want to go back to when you said um, if somebody is a king then that means that there's a slave somewhere I personally would bet to differ when people say oh I'm a king I'm a queen we as black people have been brought up as servants most of the time slaves so it's like now we are trying to fight that mentality that oh i'm not a slave i'm a king but that doesn't mean that there is a slave somewhere it's just like personally i feel that we are all gods everyone is a god that doesn't mean that if i am a god then you are evil or you're satan or you're devil or you are a servant i am just a god in my space you know so if um people say oh i'm a king that doesn't mean that oh another person is a slave to me no i feel like they're just saying that in their space just like the way you were talking and I love how you were describing your space how you're trying to make your space better you know that makes you a king in your space I'm a king you're a king no you're not a king no all right so 
Yeah. No. No, no, I do not I do not disagree with what you are saying. Okay. I disagree with it for me. Okay. All right. Does yeah. that make sense? It makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you Last should I uh, um, I'll give it back to one love. So this is it for me, right? I don't think it is bad for people to see themselves as kings and queens. I don't think it is bad. I think to to present that nowhere how it you can become a king and queen. Don't just look at the crown. And it's golden and it is very attractive and say so, oh king and queen um there is please i might be wrong maybe god has come down to kill somebody in front of somebody but as god come down god will just come down because there's a difference between saying i am i am god i'm not king if you can show me where God has come down to kill somebody, not somebody killing in the name of God, though. Am I making sense? Yeah, but I can show you history of kings and queens and kingdoms, you know, oppressive and killing. And and I also feel like it is this very romantic notion to feel like our reality as black people is uh, very controlled by what white people did to us. Yes, um, the transatlantic slave trade happened. But before it happened, they were kings and queens. And while they were kings and queens, they were slaves. And people were dying for those kingdoms to survive. I come from Benin. The Benin people are known as war people. You know, they were conquering other people to expand. <laughs> Kings and queens have been killing people forever. And that's where black capitalism also presents itself. Black capitalism takes advantage of black people in the notion of, oh, we want to fight white capitalism. So to fight white capitalism, you have to support black capitalism because only a powerful black person can fight a powerful white person. All of it is a lie <laughs> for me. Yeah, because it's about who is drilling more oil than the next person, mm. who is polluting more water than the next person. And, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to now say because the white person is drilling more oil, the person who is drilling oil in in uh, Kofuridua or, or 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 Cape Coast is not drilling oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that person is drilling oil, and that person's father was drilling oil, and that person's Father, father was drilling and drilling and drilling. So they know drilling. So that is why when the white person come here to drill, they identify. They come and come and help us drill because you have been drilling. Uh, Blas, I want make we in in like the current situation in Ghana, Nigeria, and, and so forth in relation to this overbearing. And LGBT hate bill and how masculinity plays out in that you know like for me it's like if nothing at all I am super strongly again if it's like for super selfish reasons which maybe 90% of it is it's for my own protection right because this bill and the backers of this bill are pushing this handmade tale binary reality of what a man is supposed to be, what a woman is supposed to be, and nothing else exists beyond that. And for me, I already, in a way, just in my appearance and some mannerisms and company, will be deemed or am queer for that. And how that, you know, affects, I mean, how that endangers my life and people who appear to be gay or are gay. Um, when I was growing up, it was nothing. Like, it was a normal 
and I have still have friends that we still have these kind of physical interactions, hugging, holding hands, walking, holding hands, and all these kind of physical things, which got stripped away from me when I moved to Texas, because I went to a, live with a family, a cowboy family, in some farm, and the first thing Rusty Riley told me in, at Austin Bergstrom Airport, I forgot it's called. He said, um, I heard you guys hold hands in Ghana. I'm not going to be doing that gay stuff. And I didn't understand anything he had said. I didn't understand what he meant by gay stuff. I was totally like, you know. And so that's where I started realizing the boundaries other people had set, physical boundaries and so on and so forth. And then they started adjusting my masculinity and how I dressed and what I like. Because as a child, I like wearing my mother's stuff. I like wearing like my cousin's stuff and so on and so forth. But then I went through a certain forge, a masculinity forge at some point in my life. And it kind of went hand in hand with like my Christianity at the time. And when I got free of my Christianity by reading like Check and Tadiop and listening to Fela and so on and so forth. When I, when I got rid of my Christianity, my religion, which is super masculine, of course, it's like five women. Yeah, with Christianity. Yeah. But you got rid of Christianity yeah. and those toxic masculine or the journey into unlearning toxic masculinity yeah. by listening to toxic masculine men yeah yeah it's like i remember i mean it's the same no, like i'm not i'm not understand. i'm not not saying that you are not learning their ways though. no 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 i understand but that i'm like <laughs> yeah but it's like you being physically touched yes. in the bathroom yes and by somebody who was sexually approaching yes. you it was a man and you got rid of your homophobia yes through that yeah yes. so you understand what you're saying you see yeah, yeah. so but well, are you saying that that we are doing something good? Men are doing something good. <laughs> no, but it's about the coincidentalities saying, of things. Yeah, I'm saying at the end of the day, it's not as easy as good and bad. Yeah. Because I personally feel like Diop and Kuti are yeah. very toxic people. Yes, definitely. Beyond men now. Yeah. Just very toxic people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Diop to gain that wealth, because people push Diop to push um, African progression, Africa has always had wealth and knowledge and stuff, but we do not talk about what it takes, what it took to be that wealthy around that time in Africa. Mm. That's a lot of people dying, that's a lot of people being oppressed, that's a lot of people just vanquishing right mm. so that's why for me i don't like money even though i know that it helps me to be here one of the unlearning that i i do every day is to remind myself that money is not the root of peace and happiness and sweetness because a lot of this things are rooted in the want of something mm. more mm. and so i ask you now these people when you stumbled on it mm -hmm. to unlearn that stuff mm -hmm. how are you unlearning these people who taught you how to unlearn that stuff yeah, so i didn't know anything about them like i didn't learn about their lives you know i just learned of i just read their books but I didn't know anything about them, you know, so of course I would have adjusted certain things, but I don't know if that would have been good or bad at the time. It's like finding out about Gandhi being like this peace, peace person and later finding out Gandhi was a racist, you know, it took me like... And the two of them can be true. Yeah. That's another, that's another yes, reality yes, because yes. that's the reality that I'm trying to have about toxic masculinity, which is the person presenting masculinity and toxic masculinity time and space can be different things to different people 
Yeah, but if it's toxic, there that one there's no good in any Yeah, case, but no. it's toxic to the person that it's toxic to. Mm. Right? Mm. And that same person can be the love of somebody's life, not even sexually, just by liberation. That same person who takes it upon themselves to oppress somebody can be liberating another person, another place. How do you teach that person how to unlearn their toxicity when they can show you how it helped them liberate that person? How do you teach Diop and Kuti, for instance, how to unlearn their toxicity when their message liberated you from your Christian ideologies? I be African man original. I that statement is faulty because it's nothing like an original African man. That statement is like an entrapment. It it puts people in this space of I'm the head. It's almost replica of it. I see a lot of people flourish in that to show their blackness and Africanness. But what about the other side of that statement that is oppressive? How do you ch- ch- tell um, now? Now me. Let me use me as the toxic man moving around space. How do you tell me that this thing that I have learned, this strength that I use to protect my family and my loved ones, how do you tell me that this thing is toxic? How do you teach me to truly realize that now? Nah, Yes, you might think you are protecting your people, but you're actually causing harm to so many other people. Because I can say, no, I'm, I'm like this because I have to protect. Yeah, but aren't we mixing just masculinity with toxic, or are you saying you don't see not, the difference? I don't think masculinity is you have to protect somebody. Mm. Masculinity can be you wearing this skirt. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when we think about it, then there's this is meal. Yeah, because people have presented masculinity as trousers and this and that, sit right, meet your chest. That's why people are going to the gym and stuff, right? Yeah, but masculinity. I've missed four days of gym. <laughs> masculinity is crossing your leg, wearing a skirt, wearing a dress. That also can be masculinity. Why is that not masculinity? Why is masculinity not a soft voice? Why is masculinity not oh I don't have I don't have a uh, time to jog? So basically, I mean, from what you're saying, like what is happening in my head is saying that there's no use for the word. Um, like they shouldn't ex- these words should not exist in utopia. But I don't believe in utopia, right? So like like in the previous conversation. I was saying that I'm a contradiction. So I don't believe in utopia, but when you really look at it, the word masculinity and the word feminine and masculine is problematic yeah. because it's almost like saying man and woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like if, like, remember two years ago, was it when they were trying to introduce uh, sexual education, comprehensive, three years ago? And I feel like if the, the youths were growing up knowing about genders and non-binary and sexualities and all these realities that in their future they will not have been having to have this conversation, you know, about what is masculine and feminine because it's it's just everybody's queer, you know. I have a question for you now. Yeah. So you present the way you present, yeah, and you move through space the way you move through space, mm-hmm. and I'm and I am conscious of the fact that you can move on top, middle, and low. Where those mean? You said middle class just now in in, okay. in um, Ghana. So let's look at working class, mm-hmm. right? So you have a group of working class people for be around you, and you people are just. Yes, they know this side of you, but you also have a side where you can survive anywhere. So you also have a side that also can be authoritative, Mm -hmm. that can take control. Mm -hmm. So the people who might be around you might also 
be feeling that energy. Mm -hmm. They know that you are like this, so you're wearing your skirt where you dress how you want, but they also have seen you in action. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell them what to follow? How do they know that they are supposed to be in transition? Mm -hmm. How do they know which of the side is the right side? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an idea how they'll figure that out. But I just hope, you know, in the way I move that people are able to tell me what I make them feel at which points in time or are able to remember what I make them feel and if they are kind enough to replicate that to other people they will also you know put out those kind of energies um, but at the same time everybody is different you know and you don't know who you're hanging out with and how traumatized they are or not so you can't gauge how they are going to react to you you know some people might shut down completely you know so i don't really i, I mean it's not a thought that has really crossed my mind as to how i think they should navigate me so when you find yourself in the toxic part of masculinity mm -hmm. how do you navigate that well the thing about toxic what i feel when when it comes to um what i think is the toxic masculine side of me is usually i feel or maybe i'm wrong but i think it it shows up as an attack on my ego or anger and for me i am lucky that most of the time i walk away from confrontation or I find something physical to do like I'll just start doing push-ups in the middle of an argument or something you know just to use up the energy um, yeah, and yeah and then when it's something to do with mistreating someone I I tend to get like yeah it's still it's still a block off but then I really sit down and physic like I try to transform into them. Like I sit down and I start seeing myself as the person I just offended. And then apply what you know of start f imagining what it feels like as that person to have been, you know, affronted by myself. And then that sadness or sickness or repulse like whatever it is i feel i take that into heavy consideration and then you know i approach them either with an apology or you know whatever else like that comes to my mind but that is i think the key thing is to really i that i try to do often is to really become that person do you remember if you do do you remember the point where you realize you just had to be a better person? Oh man, there's many points. I mean, and none of, I just know there are many points. They're all kind of blurry. Time, uh, um, country, space, memory. Poor man. Oh. One thing that you can remember, you be like, at this point, things had to change. Not really, you know, I just, I, I remember a point where I was about to go into the forest, to live in the forest, like to forage and to live by a river. That was my thing. And what led me there was, it was around the time 50 Cent was blowing up, right? And I was living in, I don't know if I was living in LA or in Texas at the time. But I was, I started, re had started reading these books, these pro-black conscious books, you know, and I was hearing about blood diamonds. I had a friend that was on, he did the voice for one of King, 
Kanye's songs on Blood Diamonds. It's called Chosen from Sierra Leone. And um, I was thinking about diamonds, and I was thinking about why people need diamonds. Like, what is it that they put the value into these stones, and people's limbs are getting chopped off for, and so on and so forth. So, what's it with these diamonds? And why can't people live without them? Then I realized that at that level of capitalist success, those things, adornments become a necessity within their circles to assert certain dominances, certain, you know, it's like an advertisement of how much power they have or so on and so forth, of class or fashion or whatever. And then I tried to think of what was similar on a level down. And a level down being the working class, let's say American who's driving to work every day and filling their car with petrol, which was killing the children in in Iraq and Iran for the oil, you know, the Saddam Hussein thing. And so I was like, ah, so that's also at that level too, that's not really, you don't really need that oil or that car. You know, you can find a way to work and to survive without it. So like, I, if I'm, I can't judge the diamond people, I can't judge the car people until I move into the forest. But I never made it to the forest because of iPhone. <laughs> I like iPhone. So that's something I remember. And that was me trying to become a part of this planet instead of, of like a parasite of it. Okay. Um, there's a quote I will look for there. Mm -hmm. But before that, who do you hold responsible for the residue of patriarchy, misogyny, masculinity and toxic masculinity that you carry? Indiana Jones is one of them. Uh, Hulk Hogan. Basta Rhymes. Um, who else? Yeah. I guess a lot of Hollywood stuff, you know, that's what we're consuming a lot of, you know. We didn't really get to see other things growing up. So just. Uh, and have you had the. Hey, and Father Christmas. Right. And Jesus. <laughs> 